So, hello and welcome to the science of roller coasters. So if you're new to this type of format, essentially what I do is I put out topics that are viewer requested and everybody votes and then they pick which topic they want me to talk about. And this week we are learning about roller coasters. And so what I have here is we've got a little interesting GIF image. If you have questions, I do interact on Periscope. The lights are on. <laughs> so I'm able to answer your questions directly as you post them to me. And so I'm covering the basics of roller coasters today. This requires a little bit of information in regards to physics and what engineers do. So welcome, welcome. So let's talk a little bit about roller coasters. It's a combination of various things including forces and energy. And these all work together to give us this really cool experience known as roller coasters. So if you're prone to motion sickness, I apologize in advance because <laughs> there's some really cool animated gifts that you can find in regards to roller coasters. And I like to use a lot of different things, especially in this format. So, we're going to talk about potential and kinetic energy as well as the different forces involved including gravitational centripetal, centrifugal inertia, and friction. So let's start with the basics. We're going to talk about energy first. And so the main forms of energy that we're mostly going to look at in regards to um, roller coasters is potential and kinetic. Potential is um, the, the pot potential of energy it builds up at the top. So if we're looking at like a ball here in this case, this ball has a lot of potential energy and it's going to be equal to the kinetic energy. Kinetic energy, we're talking about um, kinetic energy is a form of energy. Potential energy is a form of energy. And so since we cannot create or destroy energy, we can only transform it. So it goes from the status of possibly having kinetic energy into actual kinetic energy. So in our little graph here, we have potential energy of a ball at rest. It, and when we take into consideration gravity, when gravity enacts on it, it's going to fall. We have something called kinetic energy. So at some point in roller coasters, potential energy and kinetic energy are equal. And so I'm going to talk about that here in a second. So I want to kind of give you this little graphic here. So once the ball starts falling, it converts from potential energy to kinetic energy. And when the ball meets the ground and starts rolling, it's um, the potential energy is zero and the kinetic en energy kind of takes over. So let's look a bit more about this. So potential energy. This is related to what we call mass gravity and height. So if we're looking at a roller coaster, we have our cars at the top of a hill. So it's got potential energy here. Once that gravity takes over, depending on the mass of the cars and how high it is, the potential energy can then be converted into kinetic energy. All right. And so let's look at this. Kinetic energy is the actual movement of the cars. Now this is a pretty cool graph that I like here because it shows you how the potential energy increases the higher we go and when it starts to drop the kinetic energy takes over but notice it's um oh god what's the word I'm looking for there's a balance here involved. So whenever the potential energy increases, the kinetic energy goes down. And whenever the kinetic energy increases, the potential energy goes down. But the higher the hill, the more the kinetic energy because that's going to kind of balance out that potential energy. So let's look at this a little bit more in detail. So you remember I said the kinetic energy and the potential energy at equal like a seesaw. There you go. One negates the other. One con you know counters the other. Potential energy, kinetic energy. That's exactly right. And so at certain points in a roller coaster, we have equal amounts of both kinetic and potential energy. So if we start at A here, we have a max, kinetic energy is at its max because our car is moving, it's left the station. So we have a max amount of kinetic energy, right? So the potential energy is zero because the kinetic energy is taken over. Now as it enters that first loop, 
the kinetic energy and the potential energy are the same when it reaches the height of that loop of each of one each one of those and as it enters into that rolling again into the next loop we've got kinetic energy that's taken over now as it reaches the heights we have potential energy now remember potential energy is the mass with gravity with height so the higher the hill the more potential energy it has and the more you have there to convert to kinetic that is what I was trying to say earlier science right sometimes it's hard to kind of put into words but we've got that going there so if we go back I'm gonna go back one more time yeah, to that one oh not that one this one so as we see the higher the hill <laughs> the more potential the more you have to convert to kinetic energy all right so that's what I wanted to get into with that now let's move on to our friend forces forces are a lot of fun and forces we like to talk about in regards to roller coasters have to do <laughs> so you see seesaw seesaw yes so we have various forces. We have friction, we have gravitational forces, we have centripetal forces and forces, and we have inertia. All right, so let's talk a little bit about what each, what, what each one of these are. So friction is resistance of movement. So if you remember your physics, you, you do a lot of math, and if it's really early, early on in your physics lives, then you're like, we're gonna pretend it's a frictionless surface. Well, roller coasters are not frictionless, all right? Um, let's talk about friction. So material is everything with roller coasters. So you have wooden roller coasters and you have steel roller coasters. Steel allows a less amount of friction, which means things can move faster. So when you're talking about friction, that's the resistance to movement. So something that's going to resist it from going faster. Wooden has more friction, which makes them a bit slower. Now, with that said, in regards to materials being everything, you get a different sensation with wooden roller coasters as opposed to steel roller coasters. Wooden roller coasters, especially the older ones, you can feel those forces in acting um, within the roller coaster itself. Steel eliminates that feeling of that wobble wobbliness, so you can feel more of the forces within the coaster while you're riding it with a wooden one, but you go faster with steel because of less friction. The other ones we're going to talk about, gravitational, that's the mass attraction between two objects. Centripetal, that's where we get into the loop-de-loops, where you have the curves and the loops, the motions moving inward. We'll touch on centrifugal a little bit. And then inertia is the resistance to change in motion, and that goes hand in hand with gravitational and centripetal. So let's look at this. Gravitational forces. You guys are like G-forces. So if you're familiar at all with G-forces, you may have had some time on YouTube and taken a look at videos of astronauts inside, you know, their G-force training where they're spinning around and then some of them pass out because that happens. So let's talk about gravitational forces. G's are units of acceleration that are caused by gravity. Right now, you're exhibiting about one G. How you feel in this moment. You increase the amount of G's, you're gonna increase the feeling of weight. And depending on how your body is positioned, you're gonna feel it in different ways and in different parts. So for a second, let's talk a little bit about what G-force actually is. So we have a nice graphic, and I will tell you, I have my sources posted at the end, so if you want to get more information, I can show you links to where to go, where I've gotten my information. I just didn't have as much space on here to post them on each slide. So you can look at the end to see. So when we're talking about G-forces, you accelerate away from, or in the same direction as the Earth's pull, um, you can create an equal and opposite reaction that you can feel. So as you accelerate up on a coaster, the added G's or plus G's, positive G's, makes you feel heavier and you start to feel squashed, you know? And then as you accelerate down, 
you have those negative G's and that's where you start to feel like you're lifting up out of your seat. So these G forces you feel on each of these hills where you get that sense of weightlessness in that sort um, and it has a lot to do again with acceleration. So let's take a look at what happens if you have a phone. <laughs> so phones experience G forces. So we're going up a hill and down and if you missed it there's this lady her phone's floating up and it's experiencing the zero G's that zero force. <laughs> G forces. <laughs> so phones experience these. That's why they say hold on to your hats and your sunglasses and all of these things. That's why when you do a free fall ride, you can drop on one of those where it lifts you up and they drop you straight down. You can let go a penny at the same time because you're falling at the same rate. You can feel these G forces as you go up and over these hills. So let's talk about astronauts. <laughs> so astronauts, you notice they lay flat on their backs when they're going up into space, you know, when you have your countdown. You actually are heavier, yes. So you have what's called the apparent weight that differs from the weight of the object. So let's talk a little bit about that. So whenever the force of gravity acting on the object is not balanced by an equal but opposite normal force, you're going to have a difference in the apparent weight versus the actual weight. Now astronauts experience g-forces for several minutes. That's a lot different than what you would experience on a roller coaster, which is a matter of one or two seconds. But it's important to note that when you're on a roller coaster, your position is very important because it, you know, astronauts, they lay flat on their back and since they're experiencing g-forces for several minutes, it kind of spreads it out. They were positioned upright. They're going straight up. You're, <laughs> you're going to have either blood pool in your brain or in your feet. And so when engineers are building roller coasters, the position of the person is very important in, rel in, in relation to the amount of g-forces because you don't want blood pooling in your head because that can cause a stroke. So they try to set it to where most of the g-forces that are experienced, they pull the blood either down or up. You're going to have, if it's a stronger amount of g-forces, they'd rather have the blood pooled towards your feet than your head. And that's why position is exceedingly important in roller coasters to ensure that the blood pools there. Now some coasters have people laying flat, you know, like the Superman roller coasters. And that kind that um, shifts the forces across your body as opposed to one particular area or another. So it's important to note that. And so there are health concerns when it comes to certain types of roller coasters, especially if people are on heart um, medications or blood pressure medications, because that's going to affect it as well. So let's take a look at how this translates to a roller coaster. So here we have um, acceleration force, which is the, noted in green. You have apparent weight and you have gravity weight. So as you have a coaster that comes along through a particular route, you're going to have your apparent weight going in the opposite direction as gravity when you get to a point to where you're in that particular loop. So that's part of why you feel pulled down. It has to do with inertia as well, which I will get into in just a bit. So let's talk a little bit about types typical examples of g-force, how much and what it does. So if you're at zero g's, that's the weightless environment that astronauts train um, to become accustomed to. That's why they kind of do it in swimming pools. You're at about one g right now. High g roller coasters, they don't typically get to be about six g's. They are usually around four to five um, at the most. Three is on average. Formula One cars, you know, as they go around the loop, that's about five Gs. And then when you're talking about aerobatic planes or fighter jets, they can go anywhere from nine to 12. And then missiles are just, yeah, missiles. Nobody rides missiles for obvious <laughs> reasons, but the G-forces are pretty strong. Let's hop over to centripetal and inertia and how these two play roles 
with one another. So centripetal forces have to do with curves and circular motions, and those particular forces move inward. Now if it's centrifugal, that moves outward. Now the radius matters in regards to centripetal forces. We're going to talk about how that plays a role with roller coasters. Now inertia, that's the resistance of a change in a state of motion. More mass means more inertia. Bodies in motion stay in motion. Inertia plays a role in that. So here's a graphic here. So centrifugal force moves outward. Centripetal, centripetal with a P, <laughs> moves inward towards the center of rotation, being the middle of the circle. Um, the path of inertia is going to be the direction of where, in this case, the path of the ball is. So it's going to continue to go along with the path of the ball, and centripetal force is going to pull it in the center towards the middle. Let me give you a graph here. So this is a bit better when we see it applied to roller coasters. What are the units of change or change of acceleration? Are you talking about centripetal force? I actually have the equation for that on another slide if you want to see what the equation is. Um, so centripetal force. So the movement along the curve path is centripetal acceleration, which points to the imaginary circle drawn by the curve. Now, however, you stay in your seat during this particular roller coaster ride because of inertia. Meter per second per second. <laughs> Thank you. I do have the equation for that and I will show it to you in just a second. <laughs> so your body naturally wants to keep going on a straight path and this combined with the centripetal acceleration within this loop creates that feeling of being pushed outward, a phenomenon also called centrifugal force. So if we go back here, all right, so that's what we're looking at. So when we incorporate this into the loop-de-loop -loop type of sensation, inertia is what keeps your bodies in the seat, and then you feel that centrifugal force of being pushed into your seat, but it's the centripetal force working along with inertia in order to give us this roller coaster, um, be able to get the, the actual cars through. So let's look at the math on that. Here's what we look, it looks like when we flip it around and such. <laughs> Sorry, what is the fourth derivative of the position versus T? I can't do that math right now. <laughs> Let's, here's the equation I was talking about. <laughs> So this is in centripetal acceleration. We've got velocity squared over the radius. So if you notice, a lot of roller coasters do not have that circular loop. They have what's called a clothoid loop. Clothoid loops allow multiple points of a radius. All right, and this difference in radius allows the centripetal acceleration to increase, which means you don't have to go as fast in order to complete that loop. That's kind of necessary because if you get to certain um, speeds, you have you run the risk of a ride becoming a bit more dangerous than what you would really want. So being able to make it more of a teardrop shape actually helps out quite a bit because it allows less amount of um, speed in order to get and complete that particular loop. So there is your equation there. <laughs> Velocity squared over radius is centripetal acceleration. <laughs> so um, let me swap back to this final graphic here. <laughs> Wrong one. There we go. All right. So as we're looking at this, we've kind of covered through. <sighs> Good gravy. I'm having technical difficulties regularly. So we're going through this particular graph and we've got potential energy, gravitational, velocity, free fall. So as you're looking at this, it's not going to let me do this at the same time. Yes, see, it stops every time. All right, it doesn't always want to work for me. Well, that's all right. 
Nevertheless, as you go through and you look back at this crap, it's Saturday. <laughs> I wanted to make this bigger in the software that I have. It's not letting me do it. So, essentially when you're going through and you're looking at this particular graph, and you should be able to find it. I can post it on my Twitter so you can look at it a bit more closely. As it goes through, you have the combination of potential energy, gravitation, velocity, free fall as it passes through. Let's see if I can't one more time try it. All right. So as it passes through each of these, you've got gravitational free fall. Then you have your velocity takes into effect. Projectile motion I didn't talk about so much, but you do have acceleration with the kinetic energy, the centripetal acceleration as it enters the curve and pulls it towards the center. You have forces here, you have centrifugal forces here. Friction takes into place depending on the type of materials. And then you have acceleration through additional centrifugal force which pulls you into your seat coupled with centripetal moving it inward and then you finally get through the last bit of kinetic energy entering the station. Alright, I know I didn't have my ball moving during that time which makes me very angry, but that's okay. <laughs> Let's go to this one. Ah, It makes me nuts. It really does. It doesn't seem very fair that I can't this to totally work when I want it to. I'm still learning this software and I appreciate your patience trying to incorporate the both of them together. So what this brings us back to is roller coasters implement a combination of utilizing both potential energy, converting it into kinetic energy. Then it, they take into consideration gravitational energy, no, I mean gravitational forces and centripetal inertia and friction. The materials matter. In all of these, they have to be very careful about how they position the riders in the seats because G-forces can cause you to black out. They can cause you to puke. They can cause you to do all kinds of unpleasant things. So to ensure the safety of passengers and riders, they also take into consideration and air friction too. Yes, we just, there is no wind resistance in this particular equation as you hear in the basic physics classes. <laughs> So they have to take into consideration all of these things, clothoid loops as opposed to pure circular ones, right? <laughs> because the addition of extra radii allow less, um, you know, it, you can essentially complete the loop with a lower amount of speed that makes it still being able to complete the loop without causing any particular dangers for the riders. So, all of this together gives us the really cool thing that we have known as roller coasters. So, I am going to go to this screen so you can see all of my sources. I went to about, I went to three different sources. I hit up Google image um, search for GIF images. Now, I found that learner.org, this particular site, has its can, you can make your own roller coaster as far as the, and learn a bit more of the physics of it to see what a hazardous roller coaster, roller coaster would be. You're late. It's okay. <laughs> you can go to Scientific American. They have a pretty cool article about the simple physics involved with roller coasters. There's also the week.com. I got several images from here. The stomach churning science of roller coasters and they get to, they have a separate bit of information just on centripetal force and the importance of loops. And so with that, <laughs> that has been the goofy version of one of my science shows. <laughs> for roller coasters. Um, I had additional notes and then my printer stopped working. So, <laughs> plenty of roller coasters have the bit, have bit the dust. Um, they have and there's a few um, if you haven't I've, I've been all over the place and run, and written 
several different types of roller coasters. There are some that cause a lot more pain than others <laughs> and give me exceeding amount of headaches. I think engineers now are doing a lot better in regards to considering the health um, aspects of certain roller coasters and that certain amounts of g-forces placed in certain parts of the body is quite painful and it's not fun. So, um, <laughs> Then you have resonance failure issues. Gosh. <laughs> are you a, are you an engineer? I am not a physics engineer, but essentially what I wanted to provide with this particular um, video is basics behind roller coasters. You can get into a whole section, kind of. <laughs> well, can you tell I'm not? <laughs> But there are several different websites you can go to that get into intricate details about the forces involved with every single position of where the car is. Engineers get into intricate details about that, being able to assess where the potential, where the highest amount of g-forces would be, what that would do to a particular passenger. So they do institute a lot of different biomechanics. Does it matter where you sit on a roller coaster? It can. Um, for instance, um, there used to be a theme park out where I live where they had a roller coaster and it was wooden. Wooden roller coasters are fun, especially if you want to kind of see what it feels like to be in different parts of the roller coaster. So if you sit at the front or in the back, if you sat in the back of this particular roller coaster, that it would skip a bit on the track because you've got the force translating across the roller coaster. You have it has to go somewhere. So when you're dealing with wooden roller coasters, especially the older ones, the wheels aren't necessarily enclosed like with the steel roller coasters. You'll find a lot of the times the wheels are enclosed in in the track. So there is no skipping and there is, there's no bouncy moment, movement that you would feel like on a wooden, an old wooden roller coaster. So with the wooden ones, it's not a good thing. <laughs> yeah, if you sat in the last two cars in the back, it felt, it felt like it was going faster than if you sat in the middle. But if you sat in the front and the back of a wooden roller coaster, you tend to have slightly different experiences than if you sat in the middle. And that has to do a lot with the track and feeling the movement within the, um, tra the um, coaster itself. You can feel those forces shake around, so that makes it a bit more thrilling to a degree. Um, steel roller coasters, you don't get the same experience as that. So it may not matter so much, but you tend to see more on the steel roller coasters if you sit in the front. And you tend, I find, you tend to feel like you're going faster if you sit in the back or if you sit in the front. That's my personal opinion. I don't think that necessarily translates to that way in the math. I guess we could do the math on each individual car <laughs> within a coaster to see how that goes. You could reduce the rolling friction close to zero with magnets. Well, that's true. You could reduce it with that. And I know, I think it's Japan that's moving more towards magnetic transportation in regards to trains. And you can go a lot faster with that in that regard. Um, so I do need to take a moment to thank my Patreon patrons. <laughs> it's costly. I bet it is, especially if you're talking about electromagnets. Man, that is quite costly. So I need to thank my Patreon patrons. I have new ones. Um, Anthony and Tony with a Y. I have new patrons on my Patreon. I do update my Patreon with exclusive content just for my patrons, including um, exclusive artwork um, associated with my show. I hope to have t-shirts soon. So that's pretty cool. I do have all of these social media stuff. So if you have questions, you can hit me up anywhere on here. The only weird one is YouTube. They wouldn't let me have scientist mail, so I'm sciencey mail on YouTube. I have gotten scientistmail.com. I'm building it right now to make it easier for you to go to one place. I'm hoping to have educational content that's free for teachers, um, in addition to a place to access all my videos as well. So you would just only have to remember the one. So I'm currently working on that, and I do have an audio podcast coming soon so you can download and take science with you sciencey <laughs> i hope you've enjoyed this um 
our little talk on the science of roller coasters. Please feel free to ask me questions. I don't presume to know everything, but I try to explain it in ways that are easy to understand. Thanks for the ride. You're welcome. And thanks for hopping on here. I hope you guys have a super awesome Saturday and feel free to hit me up on Twitter if you have any questions. <laughs> have a great Saturday. Bye. <laughs> Thank you. I'm glad you loved it.